Moment istoric pentru Europa. Săptămâna aceasta, liderii europeni au arătat lumii întregi ce înseamnă unitate atunci când au ajuns la un acord pentru bugetul pe următorii șapte ani, dar și pentru fondul de relansare economică. Urmează însă și punerea în practică a deciziilor care s-au luat la Bruxelles, iar întreg blocul comunitar are de demonstrat că acest moment nu a fost unul accidental. Germania are acum președinția rotativă a Uniunii Europene, iar Angela Merkel a fost omul cheie al acestor negocieri extrem de complexe. Cord Meyer Claude, ambasadorul german la București, ne detaliază care este viziunea țării sale pentru îmbunătățirea pe termen lung a proiectului european. Sunt Cristina Cileacu. Începe pașaport diplomatic. Ambassador of Germany, welcome again to the diplomatic passport in a historical day for Europe. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Un summit care a durat patru zile și patru nopți a pus la încercare nervii și rezistența la somn a liderilor europeni. Au avut de discutat și decis cum se vor împărți banii din bugetul Uniunii Europene pentru următorii șapte ani, dar și sumele din fondul de relansare a economiilor afectate de pandemia de coronavirus. Din fericire, s-a ajuns la acord. Europa a arătat încă o dată că poate trece peste orice problemă, indiferent cât de tensionată pare aceasta la un moment dat. In the day we are recording this interview, we um, saw the deal done by the European leaders. Uh, so it's a, a budget which is uh, clear for everyone. What is not that clear is the mechanism for the rule of law. Do you think that something uh, more um, clear will come up? Allow me to just come back on uh, what you said, a historic moment. And I think it's important to highlight that. We achieved to reach a compromise on a very complex and difficult issue. And uh, believe me, I think had we talked about it uh, a while ago, would we solve this uh, uh, financial budget now in all its uh, complexity and during uh, the COVID-19 times, I'm not sure who would put, have put the money on it. Now, uh, it was not It didn't go into Guinness Book of Records for a couple of minutes because that was the summit 20 years ago, mind you, on, among other issues, the question of enlargement. And we know what impact that had. This one was about the money, but what I think, first and foremost, it was about European unity, keeping Europe together at a very crucial moment. And unity could be uh, achieved in this particular point in time only through showing solidarity to the partners most affected. Now, when those who lived through the last four days with all the ups and downs and the hiccups, they may think if this is a, a victory, I don't want to know what failure what would have been. I understand that. That is Europe. Plus. Um, uh, we are open societies, you the press, you, you learn about every little thing that happens in the kitchen. Sometimes you think, did, was that really necessary? But then imagine other societies in the world where, where we would not have learned about anything in transparent. This is Europe, open society, and in this uh, climate we achieved a compromise on the money on the relationship between loans and grants, on the vector of where the money should go into more a greener Europe, a more modern digitalized Europe, and into, and here I come to your question, a Europe based on the rule of law. That is a compromise. Uh, now we find the reference for the first time to the importance of that value in the financial framework. Some will say this, uh, this is, it wasn't strong enough. Others would have preferred it not to be there at all. This is what the European Union is about. You find a compromise. It, the striking point is, even on that very controversial issue, we did find a compromise. So in that very sense, I would say it is a success, unity, was shown in a moment where solidarity was the call of the day. But of course, it doesn't end there. Based on this, now step by step, we need to live up to the expectation on many other issues. 
Just for me as media to answer your question, yes, those images were necessary in order to see the politician in a more human way because they are human after all and they get tired, especially if they negotiate during Absolutely. long... You mentioned the, the climate uh, and uh, digital uh, Europe, but uh, I have to remind you that, uh, especially from those two areas, there were some cuts. One of the objectives of the uh, German presidency at the uh, European Union is uh, to have, uh, and I quote, a stronger and more innovative Europe. Yes. Can this still be done, even with the cuts? No, there was an agreement that of this big amount of new money, 30% is meant to go into uh, those areas. Of course, this is a political plea. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it remains to be seen uh, how each and every country is able to, to implement that. But I think um, Europe, at the end of the day, is based on the better understanding of all the members to go in this direction. And I, uh, uh, in addition to all of that, I think that, and this may, by the way, be a positive outcome of a dire situation which is the pandemic rethinking Europe in procedurally now we have many meetings uh, in a virtual fashion it works quite well we have home office in our embassy it works quite well it doesn't work that well in the end game of tough negotiations like we had in Brussels. There you need presence, you need the corridors, you need the eye to eye. But I think uh, the digital is not something imposed or a more innovative uh, Europe shouldn't be understood as they impose on us different uh, uh, priorities that are not ours. It should be seen as a real opportunity to be a front runner in the Europe of tomorrow. Understand, there are traditional priorities, especially for Romania, cohesion, uh, agriculture, and they get proper uh, uh, attention in the budget. By the way, I think, if I may say, Romania benefiting with 79.9, so almost 80 billion euros from this big package it can consider itself a real winner and it deserves to be one as i think but uh, it has now a lot of leeway to to structure the future on this basis so now we only need the good projects for those money you will i have, find. I have to, to add that as a <laughs> romanian <laughs> Um, during this negotiation, we saw some uh, new, uh, a, we saw a new pool of power, if we can uh, name it like this, uh, with the um, so-called frugal countries, um, with the lead the leadership of uh, the Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte. Uh, does this uh, going to change the the architecture of power inside the European Union is lo no longer Germany plus France and everybody else follow? Two things. First, we are not the United States of Europe yet. So it has always been the case and will be the case that uh, different countries have different priorities and sometimes different groups of countries have different priorities. Secondly, after Brexit, there is, you see, a certain restructuring of partner countries within Europe. There are issues that traditionally we always identified with uh, the UK, but that are important to others as well. Now, those others may feel they need to step up to, to make those points heard. I think, though I hear that uh, fear sometimes, that y Europe falling uh, into different power groups, um, I think there's nothing wrong with that as such, provided the overarching aim remains to find compromise and a common denominator, as we did this time, through difficulties. And as I said, you heard it as a press it, at times, where is this going? But at the end, we had the compromise. And I think the, the I'm proud to say in a way that uh, I think the example was set with the uh, German-French agreement uh, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in May, where really Germany came 180 degrees across, uh, 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 around, um, 
it could have been or was traditionally seen as a frugal one too. And for good reasons. We had our arguments. But we felt this is the time where national interest has to stand behind or European overarching European interest. We wanted to set and have set the example. Uh, this didn't mean that it accepted, accepted from one day to the other, as we could see. But again, I would hold that it was probably the most important message prior to the summit and prior to the issues we were dealing with to encourage the others to do just the same. At the end of the day, put national interest behind uh, overarching European interests. Well, this can, can be uh, described as a vision of Chancellor Angela Merkel, and uh, if we read the media today, we uh, saw some um, remarks saying that uh, since your uh, Chancellor will end uh, her mandate soon, Europe will lose somebody with a good vision, and it would be like a gap. Do you feel it in the same way? I have to say, after this performance, it's hard not to feel it in that way. Not only did she behave like a real stateswoman, having a clear strategic target, keeping it throughout all the difficulties, not losing her temper. I think he was, I, sorry to say that it sounds like, like praising uh, my own government, but in this case, she set the example. And um, obviously, uh, and this is not telling anybody a secret, is solving this very complex and difficult financial issue, it needed a bigger country to do it. So it was a lucky coincidence in a way that we had both. Uh, the presidency right now and the leader uh, to, to conduct it. Um, I think her decision stands, and she, I'm, I'm sure uh, a politician of her size will find uh, other responsibilities, but it, it, it is a, uh, it's not the worst way of ending a career, let's say, on, on, on a historic note. Among the discussion for the uh, for the budget, there are also some other uh, discussions among the European leader. Let's take them one at a time if, uh, if you want. Um, of course, we will be having the Brexit uh, very soon, yeah. at the end of this year. So we have the end date, we don't have the, the uh, end uh, agreement. What will Europe lose if such an agreement won't be uh, made in the end? I think personally, but also officially, that Europe will lose a lot, and the UK, of course, will lose a lot if we end on a hard Brexit. In the first place, we never, we had always hoped it wouldn't come to that point. But now, here again, we are in an end game. By the way, these are the two issues that we had to solve or will have to solve during our presidency, simply because time is running out. Mm -hmm. The financial, we did, hopefully, and uh, now the Brexit. Um, I am in contact here also with, with my British colleague. I, uh, the information that we have is at least that uh, there's serious work going on, even if we don't hear of it every day. After this, the financial and the summer break, we will have about seven, eight weeks because this will be then also have to be adopted by parliaments to try to avoid a hard Brexit. Can I assure you, we want the deepest possible relationship with the UK as the good partner it has always been, despite the differences on that particular issue. But we want Britain close by our side for so many reasons, economically speaking, security, defense-wise, you name it, foreign policy. Well, Europe showed that uh, it can be united if it, uh, it's a must. And uh, one uh, topic where Europe can still be less united is China.
uh, we discussed together during the pandemic yeah. uh, about China, yeah. uh, but it was rather the health uh, approach of the problem. The Chinese philosophy says that they see the world as a big community, but they fail to say who is going to uh, rule it. Uh, what type of, of relationship should be between European Union as a, hu as a bloc, uh, united bloc, and China as a superpower? First of all, I would say our world has become much more complicated. Me, as a child, I grew up in, uh, in, uh, during the Cold War in a clearly divided East-West. Here were the friends and here were the foes. I think our modern world is very different. Uh, none, no, not one relationship, especially with the, with the big powers, is just or should not be just one dimensional. China is on the one hand a, a very important economic partner, especially for an export nation as Germany, but for Europe as a whole. On the other hand, it's also a rival at the strategic level. and. When it comes to values, the Hong Kong issue, uh, I should say, a real political challenge. So um, the fact that a partner of that size is a challenge on the one hand and a, and a, uh, and a partner on the other or, it just shows us we need to define our own policy. We cannot change the partner, but we can position ourselves. And that's why Coming back to the first topic, the, the historic deal is not on 10 or 50 billion euro more. It's about do we have unity through solidarity within Europe or not? Because we need unity on each and every issue of global importance to project our interests properly and to defend and to defend our security because i mean that clearly we can see wherever we leave divisions there are others out there who play on these who blow them up and uh, and, and and enlarge them so common denominator uh, i would say for this moment in time for europe is unity is perhaps not all but without unity almost anything else will be nothing because we cannot achieve what we want to achieve and that applies to China as well. And if we talk about the relationship between United States, which is a, a traditional partner of European Union, uh, also we are a member of NATO, so we are military allies, we have the same values. But on the other hand, the uh, politics that this administration uh, is doing right now um, somehow seems not to be in favor uh, of the rest of the world, but only to America first, as Donald Trump yeah. actually said it. So. How do this uh, administration type of politics uh, affect the relationship with the European Union? Of course it does affect, and what I just said about China, it, it, at least in, in general terms, can apply to the U.S. Our mm -hmm. relationship is not one-dimensional. It's much more complex. There are, uh, there are issues that give us real concern. But of course, on the other hand, the U.S. is and will be, at least that's our strong, strong interest, our most important strategic partner. Uh, so here we are talking about uh, still two very, very different relationships. I, I'm saying that because I appreciate that, that Romania, among European partners, is such a strong proponent of this strategic relationship. It's a strong voice in Europe, and it's, it's, it's very helpful because we share the same uh, objectives. But does that prevent us from uh, adjusting uh, our policies towards issues that, that uh, are, are problematic? No. Uh, and I, by the way, don't think that it's even an issue of one politician or his successor. Uh, it's a structural change in the relationship. We need to reposition Europe. That's why we shouldn't waste time any longer. Uh, Europe and uh, Europe's security will never be uh, an alternative to transatlantic security, but enhance our role in it, uh, have a bigger footprint, uh, be more capable, 
not uh, not in a false sense of autonomy because we won't be but uh, in taking greater responsibility this will hold true uh, whatever the outcome of the next uh, elections in the US will be hoping still for a bit of positive momentum I have to admit Atât pentru astăzi, dar rămânem în continuare online pe pagina de Facebook a emisiunii și pe contul nostru de Twitter. Revenim cu subiecte noi din lumea diplomației și a politicii externe, vinerea viitoare de la ora obișnuită 11.30 și în reluare sâmbătă seara de la 22.30. La revedere!